Okay, everyone, good evening. Could I invite our panelists back onto the screen? Hopefully those of you in the audience have been able to catch the film. It is fantastic, I think. And Matt, I know you said that it was fun to put together, but a lot of work was into making it as well. So well done to you and to the team. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> we know that Britain is now the biggest supplier of weapons to Saudi Arabia being used in the devastating war on Yemen. And this film, I think, really uncovers the extent to which Saudi really relies on that relationship with the British government, without which devastation and suffering might not be anywhere near as horrific as it is and as it has been. Uh, according to the sources that Declassified spoke to in this, our government could literally bring an end to the war were it to pull out. So it's a really important issue, particularly for activists here in Britain, to be aware of and to be mobilising on. Uh, I'm really looking forward to discussing that more in depth over the next 45 minutes or so, and I'm delighted to be joined by three brilliant guests, who I will now call in turn to speak for a few minutes each before we get started on a question and answer session. First, I'd like to introduce the presenter of the film, a writer, investigative journalist, and co-founder of Declassified UK, Matt Kennell. Matt, over to you. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, and thanks for hosting this event. It's, um, as you say, I mean, it's for activists in the UK, I think it should be uh, a major priority to campaign on this issue because there's not many crimes of this magnitude that we're so, as a, as a country, are so intimately involved in. And Yemen, um, as was mentioned by Molly Mulready, the, the former foreign office lawyer in the film, um, that war may, we, we could bring it to an end if we stopped UK support. She mentioned that um, a lot of the kit that we've sold to them over the decades, there was a huge arms deal uh, in the 1980s called Al Yamama, uh, which is still running. Uh, billions, uh, it was actually the biggest arms deal ever made by the British government, it was under Thatcher. And it's still we're still producing and, and, gi and giving um, the Saudis weapons under this uh, under this deal. Um, but as she mentioned, a lot of the kit that we've already sold them, if we stopped arms there, they wouldn't be able to sort of repurpose it and put in Chinese kit or uh, US kit. It doesn't work like that. You need the BAE mainly produced weapons. So if we can stop the government selling those weapons, the, the Saudi Air Force would actually, as Molly says, would be grounded within months, which, which would be a, a huge victory for, for humanity because the scale of the disaster there is is obscene um it's the world's worst humanitarian disaster millions of children are on the brink of starvation thousands of children are starving um and this is a man-made disaster the saudis have blockaded the country um for years and stopped um vital supplies getting in so it's r to strangle the country because there's a government in, well there's two governments but there's a government in in, in power uh, in sanaa that that they don't like so um yeah, I mean, I, we did this film because because we felt the urgency of the issue. Um, since the war in Iraq, I guess, when we all campaigned to stop that war, uh, there's never been an issue of this magnitude that has so uh, intimately involved Britain. So my, we hope that what can be taken away from the film is that uh, the scale of British support, which is not widely known, that's the other thing. You, the, the funny thing when you read the corporate media, we've had years of corporate economists and journalists uh, lamenting what we should do about the crisis in Syria, right? Which is a awful, another awful crisis. Um, and they say, should we bomb? Should we intervene in some way? We have actually massively intervened, but, but they say that they pontificate about what we should do as moral citizens. Nearly every single one of those has never mentioned or never written a column saying we should stop arming the Saudis, which is a crime we could stop tomorrow. So it's a weird kind of perverse psychology in the corporate media, whereby we only care about crimes that we aren't complicit in, mainly, um, and, and, and also crimes that, uh, that uh, we can't really do anything to stop. Um, so I, I would say we need to refocus because we have, as I say, the media is uh, effectively operates as an arm of the state and the state has a lot of vested interests involved in uh, arming the Saudis. So we need to raise this issue and make it a major issue and make people aware of British involvement outside of the corporate media because they're not going to help us. And, and this film is a good example of that. Why hasn't this film been made by the BBC? Why hasn't this film been made by ITV? Any, any, it's, it, we did it on 
I say I, I was someone asked me what the budget for it the other day was, and I think I was I sort of thought I think it was just for petrol for me and Phil to go up to uh, Preston. So like it wasn't expensive. Uh, it was two of us, mainly Phil, to be honest. He was the producer, writer, and director. But imagine what you could do and what you could expose if the resources of the mainstream media were put towards exposing our government's complicity in the world's worst humanitarian crisis. This could stop tomorrow. So the, we need to have a righteous anger about the fact that this isn't being raised as an issue, but also fill in the blanks for, for the rest of society. I know it's hard because we don't have access to all these... Um, uh, establishment institutions which ha which generally have the resources to project opinions and, and, and journalism to the society at large but I think we can do it and and it does break through every now and then there's a amazing um, NGO uh, campaign against the arms trade which is based in London <clears throat> in fact as a journalist I think it's the best NGO I've ever worked with they're so rigorous in their reporting uh, and their research and they also really um, have an impact. So they, they were the ones that brought the case against the British government to stop them arming the Saudis and won. It was reversed soon after, but, but that was a major victory. And, and that uh, did get the issue um, out into the mainstream uh, in a way that it hadn't before. And I think, sorry, I'll just finish with this. I think that you saw uh, from the part of the film that we finished, I think it was the end, when we went to Preston, which is near Wharton. It's about a couple of miles down the road. It's the, the nearest major city. And we were just talking to normal people on the street to say, did you know, did you happen to know that two miles down the road, this, this flight is going every, every week to, to Saudi Arabia to help them bomb Yemen, which is the world's worst humanitarian disaster? Hardly anyone knew. But more importantly, when they were told, they were outraged. And, and I think that that is why it's so important for the government, for the establishment and the various interests in it to keep this as a dirty little secret, because um, as soon as people find out, uh, there's not many people that once you tell them the facts that can defend it. Um, even UK government ministers find it hard when the facts are presented to them by journalists, which is very rare. But so we can win on this issue because it's not a very complicated issue. The Saudi regime is one of the most disgusting regimes in the world. Um, uh, uh, the war in Yemen is 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 one of the worst wars, um, and it's uh, it's created the world's worst humanitarian crisis. So it all stacks up to make it a really easy argument to make. Um, so we just need to keep making it, and hopefully um, we can uh, we can stop it. Thanks, Matt. It's quite hopeful there about what can be achieved. The next guest I'm going to introduce was a Lance Corporal in the British Army until last August. He was born in Yemen and was arrested last year as he protested Britain's role in the war. You may well have seen him speak at sort of the war online event before, or at least seen the photos of his brave act of resistance dressed in full uniform. Ahmed al Batati, it's really great to have you here. Ahmed, over to you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I'd like to just congratulate Matt and Declassified UK for making such an amazing uh, and important film, should I say. I just want to add on to what Matt said uh, about mainstream media um, and how important Declassified UK is uh, and the stuff that they do. Um, it's, it came at no surprise when I did the protest um, that people like the BBC and ITV um, didn't report on the protest, even though it went worldwide. Um, it was covered by Al Jazeera, RT UK, uh, all around the world. It was broadcasted in many countries, um, but the BBC and the ITV uh, did not cover it, even though a BBC reporter did interview me on the day of the protest. Um, that doesn't surprise me whatsoever. Um, I think it was during uh, the times I was getting investigated during camp um, when um, all they could ask me or all they were concerned about um, was who was covering it. Do not speak to anybody. I think Britain um, has had this clear message that they don't want anybody to know about Yemen and Britain's involvement in arming Saudi Arabia, because deep inside them, they know um, that what they are accountable for and responsible for, which is um, claim right, uh, arming terrorism, simple terrorism, uh, just because it is a country 
um, does not make them uh, uh, um, or let them have a free pass uh, into um, creating terrorism. Um, there's, there's many things that I picked up on the uh, film. It was an amazing film, honestly, like the accountability, uh, the failure of accountability is, is there from the chairman of BAE Systems when he says things like um, this ridiculous, ridiculous statement of saying that to stop war, the solution to stop war is to arm war, which is a stupid statement. Um, because we all know, uh, the people that know about Yemen, the people that know the history of war, uh, it does not, the solution is not arming it, it's not fueling the fire. Um, and I think if you ask anybody um, that is Yemeni or has family in Yemen or knows about Yemen in, in general, will tell you in the next decade that as far as now, the war will not stop. If it continues as it is in the next decade, there'll be more people starving, there'll be more people get, being killed, uh, and the and British media will carry on to trying to stop the public from getting the information. So I would advise anybody that is um, viewing this right now, you have the right information. You've been given the right information thanks to uh, people like Matt, uh, people like Declassified UK and Stop War Coalition, now it's time to pass on that information um, and don't give those in power the privilege of silencing you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ahmed. Our final speaker is the convener and founding member of the anti-war group that was founded 20 years ago this year from Stop the War Coalition, Lindsay German. Lindsay, over to you. Thanks very much, Shelley, and, and thanks Matt, I mean, congratulations on the film. I think it's a very, very powerful film and it tells you so much in in a relatively short space of time. It tells you a huge amount of, about what is going on and what the links between Britain and Saudi Arabia is. And I'd also like to thank Ahmed very much for, for his contribution tonight, but also his contribution to the movement, which was a very brave thing to do and uh, very, very important and powerful for us. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points I suppose uh, the first I would like to do is to perhaps take us back a little bit to a bit of history and there's two things you know in terms of what Ahmed was saying about you know these wars kind of continue and all this sort of thing it's an interesting fact that when the possibility of bombing from the air was first mooted which was after or, or began during the first world war and after the first world war that actually there was a movement to make all bombing from planes illegal because it was a war against innocent people it was a war against uh, humanity and this was a serious proposition in the 1920s which as we know from history was unfortunately defeated and we saw increasingly the bombing of Spain in the 1930s we saw the second world war bombing we saw Hiroshima and Nagasaki and we've seen on and on bombs which are greater in intensity and wars which go on for an incredibly uh, long period of, of time. And I think, you know, we need to put Britain in this context because Britain relies incredibly heavily on these industries, on the so-called defense industries, which aren't defense industries at all. They are attack industries and they're very much connected. And I don't think it's an accident. They're connected with some of the most reactionary regimes in the world who use uh, the bombs against, uh, in the case of Saudi, the bombs against uh, the people of Yemen, but also they use weapons that they buy from countries like Britain in order to repress their own their own populations. Second point I think it's worth making about Yemen is that Yemen was a colony of Britain. And I remember when I was young, there was a colonial war which went on between the British troops and um, uh, the liberation movement in, in South Yemen around Aden. Uh, where the British were, were eventually driven out. And that colonial legacy is still there, that although we don't have a formal British empire in the sense that we did um, up until the 1960s, 1970s, we still have that colonial and imperial relationship. And I think it's incredibly important when, when we look at these things. And 
it, when we consider that Saudi Arabia is incredibly important to the British economy, to British society, we know that not just the successive governments, every government um, is hand in glove with the Saudi uh, government. Um, we know that uh, the royal family is very, very closely tied to the Saudis. Matt's referred to the uh, Al Yamama uh, arms deal, which was um, done with uh, with Margaret Thatcher, which was an absolutely disgraceful deal, and we're still living with the consequences of of that today. And all these things are very, very closely connected. So I think it's so important that we show the links between the arms trade, the deals with the most reactionary countries. And again, you know, very well done to go and highlight at the arms fair, the role of, um, you know, what happened to Khashoggi, who was who was murdered in the most obscene circumstances by, uh, by the Saudis. And uh, very, very important to do that. One point I'd just like to add to all this as well, I think going to Wharton was an incredibly quite a brave thing to do because these towns are obviously dependent on these industries and therefore there's a lot of people who might otherwise uh, not disagree with you but who do disagree with you when you try to you try to raise these kind of issues we should also remember what a poison these um these connections are inside british society as well and that in places like Wharton, the town depends on those jobs. They're told that's the only jobs they can they can have. So many towns like that have lost industries of all sorts of industries, and therefore people become increasingly reliant on it. And one of the things I think we have to campaign on is there is an alternative to defense production. There is an alternative to this kind of military um, hardware. And it's very, very important we put that case. If all we can offer to people in terms of jobs is that you are building weapons of destruction of people in Yemen or people in, in Iraq or people anywhere else in the world, then frankly, there's something deeply wrong with us society and we need to we need to look at different ways of organizing society so people can produce things that are useful to people in Yemen rather than destructive to people in Yemen so those are my initial thoughts about it and just thanks very much for such a powerful film thanks Lindsay for those reflections those who are watching please do feel free to post some questions to our panelists either in the chat or in the Q&A box at the bottom of the the zoom screen I regret to say that those of you who are watching us on the Facebook feed won't be able to ask questions. But I'm going to ask a, a couple just to, to start off with. I thought it was really interesting, Matt, hearing what the locals in Wharton had to say to you about their experience of, of living near the site and what they knew or really didn't know about what went on there uh, or where the planes are sort of flying to. And were you surprised by how little they were aware? Um, yeah, well, our first point what would be that it was actually very difficult to get anyone to speak. Uh, we went round for hours trying to get anyone to say anything about what was happening in there, and and no one would. Um, that's because, as Lindsay mentioned, these often these towns, the whole economy is built around these sites. They're they're often in uh, <coughs> places that have been deindustrialized and the uh, previous industries have not been replaced by anything. So these arms manufacturers are presented by the government and the companies themselves as the great saviors of, of, the, of the area. And many people imbibe that propaganda uh, um, so, and are scared to say anything about what's happening inside because either they work inside or their friends do. But we did speak to, uh, as, as you would have seen in the film, a couple of people that, that, were, that, that did speak and didn't know anything about what was happening inside. Um, there was one called Gary Isaacs, who, who we talked to after the England game, because we, we made the film this summer during the Euros. And uh, admittedly, he was a bit pissed, but he did not have any idea um, what was going on. He said, we, we see them coming in. He was quite excited by the um, uh, the planes coming in and said they put some afterburner on and they set all the alarms off. But when I asked him about, uh, do, do you know where these planes go? Are you aware of this flight that goes every Wednesday to service the... The, the fighter jets of the Saudi Air Force, he said, no idea. We thought that they went to other ones, uh, other local airports. Um, and that was kind of the feeling we got, even from people that, that didn't speak on camera, but we, we sort of talked to off camera. That was the same thing. And then there was 
the the old the older guy um who who had lived in freckleton which is a, a town uh, abutting the the aerodrome who had lived there his whole life and he he was very outspoken about yemen um and war generally but um he had no idea what was happening in the aerodrome itself really uh, and you wouldn't because the way that these op companies operate is very secretly uh they do not want to be exposed in any way uh, because, it, and it goes back to what I mentioned initially, that, that it's very hard to defend what they do. They're arming uh, a disgusting regime which is committing countless war crimes and has been for years. Um, so they don't want anyone to know what they're doing. This cargo flight, no one knows about it. Even people who know about this stuff, no one knows about it. Phil kind of saw that this flight goes every, every week and found out when it was from air tracking uh, websites. There's nothing in the media really about it at all. So we have this flight that goes to from a, a major um, arms production facility in the north of England to uh, one of the most repressive uh, uh, regimes in the world who are fighting uh, one of the most brutal wars in the world and no one knows about it. It's just a complete secret even to the people that live there. And as Ahmed said, that is that is how the establishment want to keep it because it makes a lot of people rich. So I wasn't really surprised that people were so unaware because uh, it's also blissful ignorance, isn't it? I mean, if you if you live in a town that is kind of booming because of something, you don't really you kind of unless someone tells you to your face, <laughs> as we did, you're not really going to seek out to find out what, what's going on around you. So um, no, I wasn't that surprised, but I think that it does it does raise uh the issue that we need to do a real program of education about um uh, about the war in yemen and specifically about the uk role thanks matt i mean if i can ask you a question now there's a particularly powerful and quite shocking few seconds in the film where you see britain's trade minister sort of defending the legality of the arms deal on the basis of of saudis meeting humanitarian laws and so on and then it then shows how two days after he made that speech four children died from an airstrike obviously you were obviously aware of what was going on you've got family understanding Yemen but what about others in the Royal Signals and how aware were or are they of the atrocities in Yemen you know the civilian casualties and also Britain's involvement in that Sorry, can you just repeat that question one more time? I didn't quite catch it. It cut off a bit. Um, That's okay. Yeah, I'm interested it. to know, um, those who you were serving with in, in the, the Royal Signals, how, how sort of aware are they of the civilian casualties and, and the situation on the ground in Yemen and Britain's complicity, you know, in that situation? So uh, not a lot of people know, actually, uh, within the army, within these establishments. Um, I think they try to keep it relatively quiet about any political view, of course. But I don't see it as a political view. I see it as a human humanitarian view um, in, in caring for the world. A lot of people, um, yes, they, they, they go into the army for uh, the wrong reasons some go in for the right reasons uh, and that is to protect and serve and for those people i really felt the sympathy behind um, their support when i did the protest there was a lot of people within the army that had agreed and supported um, a lot of them was my colleagues um, that defended me at the times where um, i was getting a lot of uh, backlash from people that didn't understand um, the place where I was coming from. Um, I think definitely it, it did uh, ring alarm bells for uh, the British government because um, I know that as soon as the story went out, um, a couple of pages on Facebook um, that a lot of troops follow as like banter pages, um, they post about me, um, but they were quick to try to eliminate it and delete it. So they got in touch personally with the account holders, even though the account holders are not army personnel serving, current serving, they were ex-military. Um, so they made it, um, they, they, they put in the full effort to take them post down because they did not want soldiers to know about what was happening with my story. 
Um, so I think definitely it's something powerful when the people get the right information um, and it does scare the British government of knowing the truth. Thanks for that. Uh, Lindsay, the film focuses in particular on BAE systems and not only are they supplying an arm to Saudi, you know, they're involved in the new Trident submarines, they make fighter jets used in the bombing of Gaza. What I want to ask is uh, what role is there for sort of divestment campaigns, campaigns which specifically target the likes of BAE? And there's a, there's a similar question here from Mustafa, which asks, do you believe direct actions such as those undertaken by Palestine action can and should be picked up by uh, the anti-war movement in, more generally? Do you see an opportunity to coordinate these activities and build a more proactive movement? Indeed. Yeah, I mean, the on the the question about British aerospace, I mean, I think we should be aware how central it is to the British establishment and therefore, you know, what British aerospace says pretty much goes in terms of governments. And there's no real sign that there's a huge, um, you know, there's any huge kind of difference between them. In, in, you know, it's very, very, you know, it's very interesting when you look at the, the production of arms, how close, effectively, it's a sort of semi-nationalised operation because it's so closely tied to the Ministry of Defence and to, and to all these other kind of things. So, yeah, I think it's very, very important that we highlight th this role in terms of in terms of Palestine, in terms of all the things that have been going on, uh, particularly, I think, with Saudi, because I think with Saudi, you've got such a powerful case in terms of the nature of the of the uh, royal family, the nature of the regime, the sheer level of repression. I mean, you know, we hear so much from our government about you know when they don't like a country and they they accuse it of not supporting democracy and all this kind of thing but Saudi Arabia surely must be the worst in the world or very you know I'm um, let's not let's not be too categorical about it but one of them you know and I, th I think it's it's very important we do have have these kind of divestments and we and you know PSC are involved in in some of those things and we work closely with them in all sorts of ways the point that um, Mustafa was making about the um the actions I think around Elbit and the companies like that I think that you know when when you look at those they're a different kind of thing from what Stop the War does I mean we're a, a much more sort of broad-based campaigning around key issues of war, um, but also with different kind of tactics in all sorts of senses. I don't see that that's a problem myself, as far as I'm concerned, that I think with the whole, if you want to call it anti-war and peace movement, and people have talked about CAT, we've talked about the different things that declassified have done, we've talked about Ahmed's kind of protest, and to me, all of these should be part of the movement. They're not something separate. And people have, you know, to be perfectly honest, people have different priorities and different tactics that they take up at different times. And that's, you know, that's a perfectly valid thing for people to do. So I think we work with people in those different ways in, in, in different times and when issues come up. And I know that there was a question about COP and the role of, the environment and so on and that's been something that people have been quite involved in in recent months particularly around COP26 you know and the the role of the military in that so to me stop the war should be supportive of all the different movements that do that do these different kind of things while at the same time having our own our own kind of priorities and and hopefully helping to support and to host events like this which which do promote uh, some of those some of those ideas Thanks, Lindsay. I've got some some useful commentary here in the chat as well, where Jenny's pointed out that BAE systems potentially involved in advising on the AUKUS deal as well, the recent deal between uh, Britain, Australia, and the US um, over defence. Um, I've also got Melanie posting a, a couple of links here to some divestment campaigns. So that's really useful. I've got an interesting question from Tom here. Uh, he says, thank you for the film to Matt. And um, he's based in the US and he's curious to know if there's been any sort of pushback against the overwhelming British presence at the upcoming Formula One Grand Prix in Saudi Arabia. I believe that's taking place um, uh, early December. Um, he says, almost all the teams are UK based. 
there are British drivers and British journalists that are about to land in Saudi Arabia and carry on as if nothing ever happened to Jamal Khashoggi. I don't know if any of you are, are interested in answering that question. I know that there is a, a, a petition that Code Pink in the States were pushing, um, but I'm not aware of any sort of activity um, based here in Britain around Formula One. Perhaps it's I mean, something something. We, we need to get active on. I mean, I don't know anything specifically about that, but um, probably because there isn't much because it's habitual and it has been for like a century because the, the UK was was a key player in actually the establishment of Saudi Arabia in the 1920s. Um, uh, and ever since then, we've been hand in glove with them. And it's it, it it's so natural that no one even mentions it. And, and the, the, the specifics of it, as we've talked about, are left out. An amazing story we did when we first started Declassified, well, it was amazing for me because I just couldn't believe it, was that since 1964, um, 11 high-level UK soldiers have been embedded in the Saudi military to, to guard the Saudi royal family against a possible coup or democratic reforms or whatever threats they face. Um, this was established in the 60s. We revealed it a couple of years ago. It had never been, it's called the British Military Mission. It had never been written about in the UK. Never been written about. This is a, we, we are, we, we, th through the threat of force, we are, in, we are keeping that royal family in power and just no one knows about it and no one seems to care. So I think that the, the case of the, the Grand Prix uh, and obviously there's all these, these other events that we constantly have uh, and, and ties that we have with the, the, Gulf, the, the Gulf regimes. No one cares because everyone's part of it. I mean, from the journalists to um, every element of the British establishment, from the arms companies to the Conservative Party to the Labour Party to um, the City of London. I recently did a story about the links between the City of London and the Gulf regime. So it's so uh, natural that no one questions it. And it's actually interesting. I think that one of the major ways you can understand how um, how uh, str uh, strongly the, the media is tied to the state is how it covers Russia compared to the Gulf states. Now, I'm sure Russia's uh, up to no, uh, wants to destabilise the UK it, as we want to destabilise them. That's, that has, that's what they call the great game, right? But there's constant um, articles in the media about Russian influence in the UK, which is marginal, really. Um, and literally nothing about the Gulf states' influence and Israel's, uh, which is huge. And it's kind of completely airbrushed out of existence. There was an interesting story we did um, recently about, based on Alan Duncan, the former foreign minister's diaries, where he basically, there's a line in there that says, um, uh, the, the Israelis think they control the foreign office, um, and they do, exclamation mark. Now that's a former foreign minister saying that, a conservative one. Um, and what, what was interesting when those diaries came out is they were kind of um, serialised in, in the Daily Mail and other places. And all they took from that was a sort of tittle-tattle, him say, saying something mean about Boris Johnson or whatever it is. And that's how it works. It's the distraction. You're given all the information that you don't need to understand what happens. Uh, and the media echoes the national security talking points and leaves out all the information you need to have a tolerable understanding of what's actually happening in the UK and what our role is and, and the different influences that, are, that operate here. I think having done this for a while now, this declassified that the most powerful propaganda technique that they have, the establishment here and it operates in the US, is censorship by omission. They don't need to actively lie because all they do is just leave out all the information you need to understand things. Uh, and that's across the board. Um, uh, the, on, on every issue, but uh, the Saudi and Gulf uh, ties particularly. Um, yeah. Thanks, Matt. It, it strikes me that there's uh, a lot more effective activity around putting pressure on sort of sports and musicians and so on going over to Israel um, that perhaps we could maybe learn from um, when it comes to things happening in Saudi Arabia. There's a really, on the topic of uh, getting information out, there's a really good question for you specifically, from Mustafa, which I'll come to in a moment because I'll give you a little rest for a minute. But there's a couple of other questions. Um, one that's come from Fatima, which asks about why hasn't the war on Yemen stopped yet and what would it take for Britain to leave Yemen? And then um, Ahmed also asked in the chat earlier um, about what uh, the war will now uh, mean in terms of Yemeni refugees coming to Europe and to Britain and what the response should be to that. 
Um, Lindsay, if I can come to you and then I'll bring in Ahmed again. Okay, well, um, on those questions, I think unfortunately, um, the uh, wars continue sometimes for a very long time because people don't have any interest in stopping them. And uh, we know that this, this war is connected with the wider geopolitics in the Middle East and particularly the um, conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran and obviously behind Saudi Arabia in this um, uh, Britain and the United States um, and Israel and you know this is this is one of the the major conflicts going on in in the world and uh, therefore there's there's still the um, there's still the compulsion if you like plus it's uh, it's a war where, as we've seen from the film, people are um, regularly supplied with uh, with weapons in order to do so, and with um, with help from Britain in order to do so. I think the way it can be stopped is both by the opposition of the Yemeni people themselves, um, but also by us doing what we can to publicise what's going on, to try to make it um, as high profile as we can, and that's very difficult. Matt's made the point about the media and I think it's a very serious question if people knew if people knew what was going on in Yemen if you just had a week on the news where people saw the bombing and saw the misery and not just in the appeals for charities which is the way that it it comes across so it could be you know there's no agency about who caused it or anything it's just happened you know these, these people are suffering from famine and uh, malnutrition and so on if people saw it for a week they'd have a very very different attitude towards it but of course they don't. Um, and so we have to do what we can to make that happen. Um, on the question of the refugees, I mean, I, I agree absolutely that uh, most refugees who come here are many, many are the victims of war. They should be allowed in. We have a huge moral responsibility for our role in Yemen, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya uh, and in many other places. And today, when we've seen, I think so far, I've heard 29 people died on uh, in the channel today drowned in the channel um in a small boat crossing in dangerous conditions i think the actions of our government and indeed other governments including the french government are absolutely criminal and that we should do everything that we can um to oppose them and last week we did have a protest over the situation in um on the polish border with belarus about the treatment of the refugees there but this is a constant and it's part of our politics internationally now. And we have to find ways of highlighting that and doing everything we can and linking it with the question of war and militarism and all those other issues. Thanks, Lindsay. Ahmed, can I bring you in on those two questions around what would it take for Britain to leave Yemen and what we should do about the refugee crisis that we may see worsen? Yeah, just going over that point, I I think we we tend to focus on the big, uh, the big, uh, the big solution, which is to end the war in Yemen and to end the arms trade. But I think what we need to focus on is is the um, the root cause uh, of what's happening in Yemen, uh, and the root cause of what's happening in Yemen is the people themselves. Like us as a society, we are the problem. Um, as as we saw in the film. Uh, there was a lot of people that m maybe knew. Some of them, I'm sure of, knew what the BAE systems do. They know that they arm Saudi Arabia. What do they choose to do? Stay silent over it. You see in uh, Matt go around the city and people um, refusing to speak out, refusing to talk because it's not befitting their interests and their desires. Um, I think as long as we have that kind of attitude, the war will never stop. As long as us as a society keep on, um, you, you have the both extremes. You either ignore it or you focus on the issue and do nothing about it. Um, and I think we need to find that middle ground where we do something uh, as a society, we bring people together within our communities to speak about the arms trade, to um, protest together uh, and, and start the campaign properly as 
the people. Uh, we can't expect the government to do anything because um, like the chairman and like you saw Boris in the documentary um, where Molly speaks about where um, when they were addressing some of the casualties, the civilian casualties to Boris, um, he would uh, make a mockery or, or have this attitude that he did not care. It's because he, choose, he chooses to ignore it um, because he knows uh, in that little short space of time is the only time where he is not distracted by anything else and he is forced to uh, hear his accountability or his responsibility. Um, so he creates this mockery or he has this attitude where he doesn't, it pretends that he doesn't care. Um, but this is us as the people, we agree with what Boris, uh, what Boris has this kind of attitude. We, we, we are on the long lines of Boris's attitude as, uh, as the people of Britain. Um, in, in terms of the refugees, um, I think definitely Britain is responsible for any refugee to seek asylum in Britain uh, because they are responsible for the war uh, in Yemen. So I think the least thing that they could do is um, tackle the, um, the, the crisis of the refugees. You're talking 80% of Yemen uh, is is in humanitarian crisis. 80% people are deprived of food, basic necessities of food and water because of the war. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thanks Ahmed. We've got a few minutes left and I just wanted to put this great question to Matt, which kind of comes back to the film and, and to declassify as a platform. And um, Mustafa asks, with the growth of streaming services and online media, do you see an opportunity to break into the mainstream media with content like this? Or does the anti-war movement need to rely on small independent outlets and publishers going forward? The reach of such good documentaries is depressingly low as things stand, which is a shame. Uh, it's a very good question. And it's one we often discuss at Declassified. And I guess we should all constantly be sort of arguing and, and interrogating as an idea of how, of how we get our messaging out. Because... We, when we founded it, myself and Mark Curtis, who's the editor, um, we kind of thought that, and we, st we still do that, that as we talked about, the, the, the main problem in our society, the, the main obstacle to progressive change is mainstream media brainwashing. Um, and the way that, and that operates, it's not many sort of even columnists on the left love to uh, the discourse is often, oh, the right-wing media, the billionaire control media, but obviously they're awful. But the problem exists across the political spectrum, across the, the spectrum of media, which is from The Guardian to The Telegraph. They all do the same thing, which is sanitise uh, Britain's role in the world and don't and, and, and uh, act, maybe not consciously, but act for vested interest within the British establishment. So, and often what happens is independent media outlets, without naming any names, you see that the closer they get to the mainstream media, they start changing and what they say starts changing. And it's an interesting idea whether they're, whether they're selected by the mainstream media because of that or the mainstream media changes them when they start appearing on them. I'm not quite sure, but you always see it. They stop talking about um, issues like this. I mean, even the sort of left stars, celebrity leftists. If you look at, if you do an analysis of what they're allowed to say on mainstream media, they can talk about sort of domestic issues um, and they can talk about sort of political battles and they can support Corbyn quite openly. Uh, but very, very few of them ever weighed in on co contemporary debates about British or American imperialism. You never really see these figures ever defending or saying that the, the sanctions on Venezuela are, are an abomination or, or, or the sanctions on Syria because that is a much more tightly guarded part of the discourse in the mainstream. Um, and that's why, so, so, so we felt that we didn't want to get involved in the mainstream media or collaborate them with them in any way because we wanted to, as a, as a form of self-preservation. Um, but again, obviously that, that's a tactical, that, that there's an argument whether that's a strategic blunder because obviously it does lock you off from the ability to get your messaging out to, to wide audience. But I think that what we want to do is just build a lot on in the margins uh, 
for a long time and hope to kind of get some mainstream uh, uh, traction just by the fact that we're doing much better work than the mainstream media. I'm, I'm, I, I, and I do believe that. And, and there's only three of us at Declassified and there's other alternative media in the UK. And what's quite good at the moment about the UK is, <laughs> I mean, uh, when I was growing up, there wasn't much that excited me about UK politics. Uh, and that kind of exists, that kind of happened until Jeremy Corbyn. Um, up till then, I was always just sort of went to Latin America for my political kicks. But actually, since Corbyn, the Corbyn movement, um, you've seen that UK is actually one of the most exciting places in the whole world for alternative media. There's loads of uh, really good um, alternative outlets that now exist from uh, Navara, Canary, um, uh, uh, Bristol Cable, uh, uh, Bureau for Investigative Journalism. Sometimes uh, there, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff happening. So I think that what we should do is is forget the mainstream. Look, they are the problem, and they are they ex they they exist to tell that establishment story. Uh, and structurally, that is that what that is their role within the British media. So you're not going to change them. They might change you, but what we need to do is come up with strategies without. Um, collaborating with them uh, that and that's the open question how do you do it what's the best way to do it because as was mentioned this uh, uh, Phil's film which I presented I think that it deserves a wide audience um, it's currently I think I uh, checked uh, about 10,000 views on Twitter I mean sorry on YouTube it should have it should be hundreds of thousands if not millions you know but but no one's going to help us because it's in too many people's interest to keep these kind of truths suppressed so in that situation, if you don't want to collaborate with the mainstream media, what do you do? And, and that's a question we should all be discussing at all times. And I know there's qu there's quite a lot of debate on this question about whether our position is wrong, uh, that that is too puritanical, that you should you should you shouldn't just lock off any any anyone who's who's willing to have you on. But but actually, the funny thing is, I think because of what I said earlier, which is that there's no space for anti-imperialist discourse at all in the mainstream, even on the sort of left celebrity end. Um, I think that means we're never even going to get offered uh, a place on BBC Newsnight anyway. Like Mark Curtis, for example, my boss, um, although he doesn't act like a boss, but he is technically my boss. He, he, he's written books, well, he single-handedly has rewritten the history of post-Second World War UK foreign policy. I mean, he's written about four or five books which completely devastated the establishment histo historiography of, of what, what we did post-1945. He never, ever gets invited on BBC Newsnight. His credentials are so much better than all these Times columnists who have never done a day of proper research or proper journalism in their lives, and they go on and pontificate. What that, and I don't think that's ever going to change. I don't think Mark's suddenly going to start getting invites from, from the BBC, even though he should. So there's two things we don't want to collaborate but i think even if we did they they, they would lock us out thanks man that's thanks, a really man. interesting principled um, position that you guys have, have taken on that um we haven't got time for any more questions but i do just want to finish by thanking the guests that we've had tonight lindsay matt and ahmed and everybody who's tuned in and i think matt left us on a really positive note of why it's so important to support declassified, support stop the war, support all the anti-war activity that's happening. My colleague Maya has posted in the chat throughout tonight about how you can join those organisations, you can sign up to donate to them and join the mailing list to find out what's happening in the future. Please do, if you haven't watched the film, watch the film, share it on social media, send it round to your colleagues, friends, workmates and so on. And spread the word it's an incredibly important uh, piece of viewing but it's also an incredibly important cause that we need to get active and mobilized around thank you very much comrades and enjoy the rest of your evening thanks very much Shelley thanks Matt and thank Ahmed. you Shelley yeah thank thanks you. a lot for having us thank you Lindsay thank yeah you. thanks everyone for what they thank do you. thank you take care all